Disc 1 Muhammad, His Life Based on the Earliest Sources by Martin Lings Read by Sean Barrett The book of Genesis tells us that Abraham was childless, without hope of children, and that one night God summoned him out of his tent and said to him, Look now towards heaven, and count the stars if thou art able to number them. And as Abraham gazed up at the stars, he heard the voice say, So shall thy seed be. His wife Sarah was then seventy-six years old and long past the age of childbearing, so she gave him her handmaid Hagar, an Egyptian, that he might take her as his second wife. But bitterness of feeling arose between the mistress and the handmaid, and Hagar fled from the anger of Sarah and cried out to God in her distress. And he sent to her an angel with the message, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. The angel also said to her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Then Hagar returned to Abraham and Sarah, and told them what the angel had said. And when the birth took place, Abraham named his son Ishmael, which means, God shall hear. When Abraham had reached his hundredth year, and Sarah was ninety years old, God spoke again to Abraham, and promised him that Sarah also should bear him a son, who must be called Isaac. Sarah gave birth to Isaac, and it was she herself who suckled him. And when he was weaned, she told Abraham that Hagar and her son must no longer remain in their household. And Abraham was deeply grieved at this on account of his love for Ishmael. But again God spoke to him and told him to follow the counsel of Sarah and not to grieve. And he promised him that Ishmael should be blessed. Not one, but two great nations were to look back to Abraham as their father. Two great nations, two spiritual streams, two religions, two worlds for God, two circles, therefore two centers. A place is never holy through the choice of man, but because it has been chosen by heaven. There were two holy centers within the orbit of Abraham. One of these was at hand, the other perhaps he did not yet know, and it was to the other that Hagar and Ishmael were guided, in a barren valley of Arabia, some forty camel days south of Canaan. The valley was named Becca, some say on account of its narrowness. Hills surround it on all sides, except for three passes, one to the north, one to the south, and one opening towards the Red Sea, which is fifty miles to the west. The books do not tell us how Hagar and her son reached Becca. Perhaps some travellers took care of them, for the valley was on one of the great caravan routes, sometimes called the incense route, because perfumes and incense and such wares were brought that way from South Arabia to the Mediterranean. And no doubt Hagar was guided to leave the caravan once the place was reached. It was not long before both mother and son were overcome by thirst, to the point that Hagar feared Ishmael was dying. According to the traditions of their descendants, he cried out to God from where he lay in the sand, and his mother stood on a rock at the foot of a nearby eminence to see if any help was in sight. Seeing no one, she hastened to another point of vantage, but from there, likewise, not a soul was to be seen. Half distraught, she passed seven times in all between the two points, until at the end of her seventh course, as she sat for rest on the further rock, the angel spoke to her. In the words of Genesis, and God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise and lift up the lad and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. 
The water was a spring which God caused to well up from the sand at the touch of Ishmael's heel. And thereafter the valley soon became a halt for caravans by reason of the excellence and abundance of the water. And the well was named Zamzam. When Hagar and Ishmael reached their destination, Abraham had still seventy-five years to live, and he visited his son in the holy place to which Hagar had been guided. The Quran tells us that God showed him the exact site near to the well of Zamzam upon which he and Ishmael must build a sanctuary. And they were told how it must be built. Its name, Kaaba, cube, is in virtue of its shape, which is approximately cubic. Its four corners are towards the four points of the compass. But the most holy object in that holy place is a celestial stone, which, it is said, was brought by an angel to Abraham from the nearby hill Abu Kubais, where it had been preserved ever since it had reached the earth. According to the prophet, it descended from paradise whiter than milk, but the sins of the sons of Adam made it black. This black stone they built into the eastern corner of the Kaaba, and when the sanctuary was completed, God spoke again to Abraham and bade him institute the rite of the pilgrimage to Becca, or Mecca, as it later came to be called. Purify my house for those who go the rounds of it, and who stand beside it and bow and make prostration, and proclaim unto men the pilgrimage, that they may come unto thee on foot and on every lean camel out of every deep ravine. Hagar had told Abraham of her search for help, and he made it part of the rite of the pilgrimage that the pilgrims should pass seven times between Safa and Marwa, for so the two eminences between which she had passed had come to be named. Rich gifts were continually brought to Mecca by the pilgrims who came to visit the holy house in increasing numbers from all parts of Arabia and beyond. The greater pilgrimage was made once a year, but the Kaaba could also be honoured through a lesser pilgrimage at any time. And these rites continued to be performed with fervour and devotion according to the rules which Abraham and Ishmael had established. The descendants of Isaac also venerated the Kaaba as a temple that had been raised by Abraham. For them it counted as one of the outlying tabernacles of the Lord. But as the centuries passed, the purity of the worship of the one God came to be contaminated. The descendants of Ishmael became too numerous to live all in the valley of Mecca, and those who went to settle elsewhere took with them stones from the holy precinct and performed rites in honour of them. Later, through the influence of neighbouring pagan tribes, idols came to be added to the stones, and finally pilgrims began to bring idols to Mecca. These were set up in the vicinity of the Kaaba, and it was then that the Jews ceased to visit the Temple of Abraham. The idolaters claimed that their idols were powers which acted as mediators between God and men. As a result, their approach to God became less and less direct, and the remoter he seemed, the dimmer became their sense of the reality of the world to come, until many of them ceased to believe in life after death. One of the most powerful Arab tribes of Abrahamic descent was Quraysh, and about four hundred years after Christ, a man of Quraysh named Qusay was established as ruler over Mecca and guardian of the Kaaba. He thereupon brought those of Quraysh who were his nearest of kin and settled them in the valley beside the sanctuary. These and their posterity were known as Quraysh of the Hollow whereas Qusay's more remote kinsmen settled in the ravines of the surrounding hills and in the countryside beyond, and were known as Quraysh of the outskirts. Qusay ruled over them all as king, with undisputed power, and they paid him a tax every year on their flocks, so that he might feed those of the pilgrims who were too poor to provide for themselves. Until then the keepers of the sanctuary had lived round it in tents, but Qusay now told them to 